and welcome to Nicholas Gruen. We're so pleased to have him. Nicholas is a widely published policy economist, entrepreneur, and commentator. Um, has lots of different publications. You can check out his bio on the website. He was also a um, member of a major review of Australia's innovation system in 2008, a review of the pharmaceutical patent extensions in uh, 2013. And in 2009, he chaired Australia's uh, acclaimed Government 2.0 Task Force, and he's here to talk to us a little bit more about that today. So, welcome. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much. So uh, I will kind of the, the talk consists of a, a kind of two halves really. And the first half is you could, uh, for an unappetizing word, you might call it theory. Uh, but it's I think you'll find it interesting. It's a very general description of the way I see these things or the way I've come to see these things, uh, looking at uh, the internet as an economist. Um, and the first, so I want to talk to you about public goods. I want to explain to you what a public good is in the, uh, in the thoughts of uh, e economists. Uh, and then I want to go through uh, those topics and uh, draw out what I see as some of the implications for uh, some of the opportunities that are yet to be grasped from the internet based on that way of looking at the world. So we all have a kind of an informal definition of a public good, something along those lines, that uh, public goods are things that won't be supplied if they're not supplied publicly, if they're not supplied by the government. Economists have asked themselves, what are the technical characteristics of goods that, that uh, give them that quality, that they are not produced spontaneously by a market? And they tend to uh, say that public goods are, a, are types of goods where two characteristics combine. Firstly, the good is a non-rivalrous good. This thing that I'm holding in front of you, this clicker uh, for, the, uh, for the presentation, is a rivalrous good. If I've got it, you haven't got it. The slides I'm using are a non-rivalrous good. Uh, uh, even in this room, there are non-rivalrous good because we can all look at them. Uh, and the words I'm using are non-rivalrous goods. Uh, and uh, secondly, there's the question of excludability. Inside this room, my words are unexcludable. I can't stop you hearing them. And so if I was to charge a price for giving this talk, I would be wanting to charge the price at the door, at the point where I can exclude you and say, well, do you want to see the uh, show or don't you? Uh, and you can see why that is important to setting up a market. And the lighthouse is the, in some ways, somewhat misleading uh, canonical example of that in an economics textbook. As ships go past the lighthouse, they benefit from the light that is cast and you can't stop them benefiting and therefore there's a problem in providing lighthouses or so the, or so the, the story goes. Um, and for that reason, economists have regarded public goods as a problem. And if you look upon the, if you look at the, this axis, excludability axis, you see the free rider problem. If something is non-excludable, you have a free rider problem because if somebody has put their money into, into providing a, a lighthouse, people can free ride on that investment without contributing to it. You can see that there's a free rider problem. Economists hate free rider problems and so they say that public goods are a serious problem in human organisation. There is another side to this which is the other axis. And that other axis defines a free rider opportunity. Because if I have funded through my own efforts, or if it might have cost me some money, uh, some words, let's say they're just symbols, E equals MC squared, then there is a huge free rider opportunity. Everyone can take advantage of that thing once it's come into existence and if it was non-rivalrous, if you sorry, if it was non-excludable, 
um, it's already non-rivalrous. We can use it again and again and again. If it's non-excludable, that might actually be a good thing. Uh, so long as it comes into existence, that might be an opportunity, not a problem, not a, not a, not a perspective that economists have been particularly vigorous in exploring. And now we are in a new world um, because look at these things. These things are public goods and they didn't get built by the government. Uh, they got built for all sorts of, uh, some of them got built for profit, others did not get built for profit. Wikipedia didn't get built for profit. So public goods are assembling themselves without governments in our new world. And uh, I want to suggest to you that that, well, the more I thought about this, the more I realized that it wasn't the whole story. But we have certainly come to think of the internet as a way in which we can create public goods. Here's uh, F. Stathia Anatolitis, a friend of mine, who tweets at the Melbourne Writers' Festival in 2012 as a public service that there's some good soup available at Beer Deluxe in Melbourne, uh, just $12. She is making a public announcement. She is, that's a public good, uh, uh, non-excluded, uh, non-rivalrous, any, no, anyone can use it. And here's a more exciting, a more, a more spectacular one of Tim McNamara who sat in Wellington while the Christchurch earth, earthquake occurred and thought, what can I do? didn't go to Christchurch and join the rescuers, uh, got in touch with Crisis Commons, got the, uh, got the volunteers around the world to pass tweets, to uh, examine tweets for specific valuable information, typically something with an address and a state of affairs. Uh, and that was then put up on, an, on a Ushahidi map uh, which was extremely stable and much better than anything the governments were running, uh, the, the government rescuers were, were running, and eventually, although the government people spent most of their time being concerned about whether, the, whether this information had been verified by the government, the government started using the map themselves and referring other people to it. Um, so this is a new world of public goods, and but there is something um, there's something interesting going on. And what's going on is that if you look at all of those platforms, every one of them is actually excludable, but a decision has been made not to exclude people. Now, it's easy to understand the decision made by Wikipedia because this was a philanthropic venture. But it turns out that Google and Facebook and Twitter can make more money by simply not excluding people from platforms which are potentially excludable. But Google, in my back of the envelope calculation, would be responsible for around about a trillion dollars a year in actual value to the world, and it can manage to make its owners wealthy beyond their wildest dreams, living off the, a few lousy billion dollars. Uh, from ads, from the trillion dollars of value that they create. If it wasn't a public good, they couldn't create that amount of value. They couldn't create anything like that amount of value, and so they would make much less money. So this is a quite an interesting new world we're going into, or is it? Uh, here's a close personal friend of mine, uh, Adam Smith, the founder of my discipline and you will know him, no doubt, uh, as the author of The Wealth of Nations, published in a quite a, a favourite year for people in this country. And that's a sort of Bible of private goods, if you like, a Bible of how markets work and how, what a terrific thing markets were. But 17 years beforehand, Adam wrote books fairly slowly, uh, thought a lot about them before he put them out, 17 years beforehand, Adam Smith had published The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And The Theory of Moral Sentiments, in many ways, is the first book of modern 
psychology, the first book of modern sociology, the first book of modern social psychology. It's really about um, how do social, uh, how do social um, mores evolve? How was it that I was able to get into a taxi this morning, uh, talk to the taxi driver, the taxi driver took me here, we didn't argue about how much money I should pay him, he didn't lock the door on me, it was all amazingly civilised for people who are supposed to be self-interested and self-seeking individuals. There is a, uh, a, th there is a powerful engine by which people create the environment in which they cooperate at close quarters and that in, uh, that those mores Adam Smith was saying without using the term are a public good they're public property well they're public property in the sense that they're nobody's property and they're highly valuable uh, I'll, I've got a slide in a minute which gives you an idea of what their value is now the mechanism by which Smith was saying markets evolve was the same mechanism by which moral sentiments evolve, mores, social mores evolve, which is they evolve spontaneously from individuals and groups living together and making choices and generally speaking seeking to advantage themselves, although that's a, that sort of statement has can, could be caricatured somewhat. The other thing that is remarkable is that language is a quintessential public good. I've never seen language referred to as a public good in an economics textbook. But language is the preeminent public good, the thing that makes us what we are, the incredible species that we are. And it didn't get built by the government. It didn't even get built deliberately. It got built in the same way that markets got built and our social mores evolved. And the remarkable thing is that when Adam Smith died, he left instructions that his papers were to be burned and he made two exceptions. And one was a, a, an essay called The History of Astronomy, which is really quite like Thomas Kuhn's theory of scientific revolutions. And the other was, an, was a treatise on the evolution of language in which he proposed the exact same mechanism of evolution uh, in which people were trying to essentially, uh, well, spontaneous order um, uh, to, uh, which drove the evolution of language, not governments. And, 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 in a, and in the world today, there's only one country in which governments think they have a major role in protecting the language, France. So uh, let me talk briefly about um, the, so, so the way I see the world is that it's not really the private sector makes private goods and the government makes public goods. It's that there is a rich ecology of public and private goods. In fact, as I will go on to suggest to you, at every level. Uh, but let's just show, I'll, I'll just show you a little bit about the alchemy of public and private goods as Adam Smith wrote about it, because he has private traders uh, addressing their mutual self-interest, making trades between each other. And they go, and then after this happens quite a bit, it starts happening in designated places. People start finding that they can make some money by, ha by creating a place in which those trades take place. And then public goods start emerging of their own accord. All of those are public goods that are generated spontaneously within a market, not by the government. A marketplace for meeting, price discovery, this incredible thing which both Adam Smith and Frederick Hayek regarded as a miracle, an incredible miracle. And it is a remarkable thing uh, that, uh, that this, this system that comes along, this public knowledge, uh, largely unexcludable knowledge, about what price things are trading at gives everyone in the economy enough information to tell them how, they, how to fit their private interests in perfectly, given certain assumptions, into the social interest from this emergent public good, the price system. Liquidity in a market, as we found out in 2007 and 8, is a public good. Uh, lack of liquidity, not so much. And there's Adam Smith 
explaining that to us and Hayek turned it into a kind of obsession. If it wasn't spontaneous order, then um, he kind of wasn't interested. Um, but none of them used the term public good, but that's what the spontaneous order that those two men were talking about is a public good. Uh, there are there were those I think they they were at their height in the 80s, uh, possibly early 90s, who spoke as if it would be kind of good. Private markets were really so clever at finding ways to provide missing public goods um, that maybe the world would be better if we didn't have public goods, we didn't have governments. Um, and uh, we actually know something both theoretically, Adam Smith said something theoretically about what the world looks like without public goods. He had probably had some experience of it or had read about it and we see it on our television screens. That's what a world without public goods looks like and that's what Adam Smith said about it. Uh, and the, so, so in my world, the ecology of uh, public and private goods is that there are all these private goods and the motive that Adam Smith called prudence or self-interest is the driving force behind the world of private goods. And then there are all these other public goods, things that don't easily look after themselves. And this is a slide, I, I, I suspect this is fairly similar in the United States, but if you're making a donation in Australia to any of those causes, you find that they are tax deductible. Uh, so we have a kind of an intuitive sense of this ecology of public and private goods, that we want to reward people who make contributions to those things which won't look after themselves because they generate public good benefits beyond private goods. Even though things like health and education can of course be sold in a private market. So I think of public and private goods as having a kind of fractal ecology, which is to say they're all over the place at every level. Within a family, um, there are public goods uh, and there are private goods. That within any human organisation, there is a sense of the appropriateness of people attending to their own needs in certain regards and a sense in which there is a legitimate group interest and that cooperation is expected. Ethics is the, the thing, the human technology, if you like, that we, try, that we came up with to solve the public good problem. And we've been solving it since we've come down from the trees uh, and we've been solving it in all sorts of different ways. Uh, this is one way in which the United States is probably leads the world, partly because it trails the world in other respects of public good building, uh, it leads the world in philanthropic uh, and civic minded public good generation and the, there is, a, new, there is a, a great renewal of that on the internet because one person's code is then a global public good which can be used in every local council everywhere in the world. An incredible thing and something which the United States caught on to faster than anyone else we're still working on code for Australia. Um, and, but, but one thing I'll, I'll go on to just explain is the, there is an ecology. Usually when you see a successful internet platform that has created an ecology of public and private goods. Let me show you what Google does. Google makes an offer to you, which is that it will generate private benefit to you. How will it do that? By finding the best possible link that you're looking for. To start off with it then harvests the internet as a public good to find out from the intelligence lying linked and baked into the internet using its algorithm it works out what are the most prominent sites that you're interested in but it does and, and so uh, but, but it does something does, does something more than that when you click on a link you help train Google you help create the public good which then feeds back to the next person's private experience and makes it better. That's sort of, you know, if you're going investing in things, you want to look for that little virtuous circle uh, because that's what's happening. That's how platforms come to dominate their space. 
uh, and, uh, uh, and, and Google uh, does this with utility and Facebook does exactly the same thing with affect. You are interested in uh, what other people click on and say, I like that. Uh, so, so the public and the private are in this ecology, this rich ecology on the platform, each strengthening the other. And this is my favorite um, platform, my favorite Web2 platform uh, built uh, by Jamie Haywood after his brother, Stephen, I think, uh, got, well, died of Lou Gehrig's disease, a horrible um, motor neuron disease in the UK, uh, the same disease that uh, the, uh, the um, man who wrote the, A Brief History of Time, uh, Hawking. Stephen Hawking, uh, uh, had. And so the idea is that it's not just a sort of um, it's not just a sort of support group, although support groups uh, generate that you know the, the, the spontaneous generation of public goods in that way. There is a platform for recording uh, data, and that that data is your diary, particularly. So if you have one of these disease, one of the diseases that they target. And, and they're expanding them all the time and they've moved into mental, uh, mental illness as well. You record your experiences, you keep a diary, and those diaries can then be, generate a lot of data which can then be turned into public goods and you can get information back about whether with your disease people who take a nap after lunch find their lives a lot better than people who don't and so on. A simple idea and it is monetized, you may be shocked to learn, by the sales of data to drug companies. Um, so, uh, so we, I suggest, have a new world of public goods, a new way of thinking about public goods. Here are the old style public goods that sit happily in textbooks, uh, and then there are, and they are, they are the public goods that exist um, because we've overcome the free rider problem, and then there are the public goods that exist by virtue of the free rider opportunity. Language being preeminent amongst them, uh, and Linux, which is this in uh, open source software, which is now this incredible thing, which is the language instinct rendered into executive code. Once you get it down, it's a global public good potentially forever. Extraordinary stuff, just ex which does stuff, which will do calculations for us and rearrange spreadsheets for us and whatever else we ask it to do. Isn't that incredible? Uh, and then we have all these public goods that are built once somebody builds a platform. They might build the platform. The building the platform will typically uh, be costly, it might take them some time, it might take some money. But once it's built, if it's built well, if it's built by people who know what they're doing or they're lucky, like Jimmy Wales probably was, uh, then all these public goods come into existence. Twitter, Google, Facebook, Wikipedia, and so on. So uh, this is the space I think that we should be thinking about, um, about the internet. I think it's a really exciting and interesting thing, way to think about out the new possibilities that, have, that are uh, presented to us. One is public goods, the old, the old uh, story is public goods as a problem, and this is public goods as an opportunity. So um, this, is, this is the question that I, uh, so, so, so look, I'll actually, I'll go back to the previous, the, the previous um, uh, slide. Now, you can see that these goods here the goods over on the left-hand side of the diagram are, they've come up with some trick, or well, I don't know whether you call language a trick, but certainly the platforms are some sort of trick whereby a public good can be brought into existence by private endeavor. That doesn't abolish the, the potential free rider problem, it just means that the lowest hanging fruit has been picked. If you can make $50 billion revenue a year, as Google can, well, it's worth your while spending a few million dollars on the platform. What about all those platforms that would generate huge amounts of 
social benefit, but for which we can't quite work out how to fund them. That's this idea that I've got for a public-private partnership. Uh, so that's the question that I posed in 2010 in Washington, actually, in the wake of the Government 2.0 Task Force, and I had a whole list of fancy, fancy um, examples and, and a lot of the principles of Government 2.0 uh, of publicly releasing data, making sure that the data is machine readable, open licensed and so on. Those sorts of, I saw those principles as essentially trying to cultivate this space. But it seemed to me that we should be thinking much more about what other kinds of things we might we be able to do. And that's a list uh, which I won't go through now because that's a list of some of the things I'll talk about in the rest of the presentation. Uh, some of these things are now, I'm now going to start with examples that are old, uh, sort of fairly old hat for people who know this area. Uh, and they will get progressively more ambitious until I finish with what I regard as my killer example, and I expect applause at that stage. Um, so this is the, so, so uh, this, these are just slides I was, uh, that we were shown at the Government 2.0 Summit in 2010 by the Massachusetts Bay Area Transport Authority. It only occurred to me as I'm speaking to you now that I've shown these slides around the world. It's kind of nice that they come back home. <laughs> uh, anyway. The, 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 the guy making the presentation said, look, our weather service information is open, therefore you get your weather information any way you like, therefore everybody knows about this stuff, it's very easy to get hold of, and in 2010 people would be in a lot of trouble trying to figure out when their next bus was coming from because you got that information from the Massachusetts Bay Area Transport Authority and uh, I hope I've got that right, I don't know whether I've got that name right, I hope so. Uh, it's kind of more forgivable in other locations. Uh, and the Massachusetts Bay Area Transport Authority would treat this as proprietary information and people would say, we want to republish this information and they'd say no. So they came up with this incredible idea that they would publish this information about how to use a public good that they were responsible for providing. And they worried, you see, as, as organisations do, they worried, how will people use this data? Will they misuse the data? How will it be made available to people? And they didn't need to worry because within, le within a bit more than a month, the data that they'd released on, a, on, a, on an API was available on six different platforms. And the thing took off. And that was just data on timetables, uh, which was rapidly absorbed into the ecosystem and then they released live data, which is data like your bus is five minutes late. And within an hour, it started appearing uh, on various internet platforms. Uh, and uh, so this is a problem that doesn't need solving. You just need to relax and, and, and take it easy. And it solves itself. Here are some examples, uh, not of, uh, of release, and they will come, you know, they will uh, solve the problem, but building, plat governments building platforms. Uh, this is an American example uh, where, I th and I th uh, where the government uh, essentially marketed the services of return service men to employers and created a, uh, a, created a, a platform which was ad of advantage to those people. This is an Australian uh, example, the National Library uh, decided to digitise its newspapers. Why do you do, I mean, what is the really cool thing about digitising newspapers? They then become searchable, they're not searchable in microfilm. Uh, and so they digitised them and someone said, well, uh, and the way they digitised them was OCR, optical character recognition, and these are 200 year old documents, some of them, and so they get, so computers make mistakes. No stop walk, no stop work, Wharfies told, is translated as woe stop work, and you can see there's some kind of logic to it, but it's not the kind of logic that we're comfortable with. And what we did at the National Library is we turned this, there is, so there's text down the left-hand side and the picture of the paper on the right-hand side, and anyone anywhere in the world can click on it and turn it into a wiki and correct it. And this thing was going to be launched, but it didn't have to be launched. It took off like a rocket, basically 
and it was never launched and it went live the moment it went live it was never un oh it's all gone ahead there uh, it was never unused so so spontaneously people started doing work on the site and uh, uh, these are quite out, these these uh, numbers are quite out of date now. I think the number is there are 70 million lines of text corrected. 20% of the correctors are outside of Australia. Very often Australian expats. That means it goes 24/7. Uh, and there's Julie Hempenstahl who describes her uh, re her relationship with the site as preferable to housework. Her house seems to be still standing although she's a bit red in the face. Uh, anyway, she was the leader for a long time, and then along came the text corrector from Hell, and Maley, who got ahead of her. They're now, there are, there are now, this is still out of date, and I think John Hall or John Warren are at the head of this, uh, at the head of this list. And those people are often flown to, occasionally flown to Canberra, and people say thank you to them, and this all keeps the ecosystem going. Um, so this was the only other fairly pathetic example that I could come up with in 2010 of governments building platforms that the private sector might not build. This is our national broadcaster building a site called ABC Open, which is a website and a system designed to uh, cultivate and broadcast, if you like, amateur content or the content of people, particularly in the regions, who can get access to some training and then if they go out and take their uh, smartphone they can do interviews and create and edit them and create programs and, the, and this website then uh, puts them into the broadcasting ecosystem. So um, an example but hardly something that would convince you that this was uh, a key to a much better world. Uh, these are uh, another, this is another, another basic idea which was pioneered in the UK, Fix My Street. This is the idea that the interface between government and the public might be provided by the public rather than the government. And uh, so a, a not-for-profit group called My Society built Fix My Street where people can um, register where their street, you know, potholes in their street, maintenance things for local government and then that goes directly to local government. We, we ran the first, uh, we ran the first gov hack, we ran a thing called gov hack, the first uh, hacking competition um, uh, that governments had run anywhere in the world. This was the government 2.0 task force and uh, that's a, a sort of volunteers turn up for a weekend and get a prize for the best app that they build and this was uh, the Australian Fix My Street, it was only a prototype, it was called It's Buggered Mate uh, and you put in what's buggered and where and how exactly is it buggered and your email address brackets to track the unbuggering and so on. Uh, and this is a for-profit version of the same thing which I thought started, I think started in Boston, it's now headquartered in Connecticut, sorry? New yeah, it's, 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 now, uh, it's now in New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, was it always? It was always in New Haven, well there you are. Uh, so, so that's one thing that's happening and, and, a, and a sort of a way of understanding that, I think quite a nice uh, thematic way of putting this is to say that when we, in the era of reform when we took government monopolies and uh, tried to unpick what about them might stop becoming a monopoly, the example with the network, with the telephone network is that the telephone network itself might have remained in government hands or heavily regulated but the telephone set uh, became, you know, it was, it was easy to say that should become a private market. And here, what we're doing is something very similar. We're shrinking those areas that are regarded as problematic and things that need to be solved by government or regulation. Uh, but we're saying it's not just private markets that can fill the gap, it's public sp uh, uh, and, the, and for profit motives but also motives of public spiritedness and volunteering can also be a very useful driver. Uh, and uh, one of the things that, uh, one of the lessons from this is, here's a thing called Open Australia, which is 
a site like this, but it's equivalent to Hansard, our congressional record, and it sort of works. It's it's better than, and this is a. Uh, there, there are ways in which it's better. It picks up spelling mistakes more quickly, and how the people working at the congressional record or Hansard often check with it to to find uh, spelling mistakes and so on. You're familiar with these kinds of examples as well. Uh, here's another example of the of the pro, of a for-profit interface. You know when uh, at schools you have to get permission when kids are going on excursion and every time they do you write down a whole lot of things about their allergies and then they get lost or they're hard to access. Well, this is all uh, done electronically uh, and uh, then when the teacher or the club master is on an excursion they can just press a, uh, the name of the student and up comes their record. Obviously hugely, uh, obviously hugely beneficial uh, and for that to happen and to happen quickly government institutions if they're schools and so on or government funded institutions have to react supplely in their own interest and often they don't. Uh, this is a, a, a sort of alpha a prototype site that uh, we set up uh, called Fix My Budget. We, the idea there is to try and crowdsource micro suggestions for saving money for governments. Now this has been done unsuccessfully in the United States and Britain because the uh, and, and the reason they were unsuccessful is that there wasn't enough structure to them and they essentially turned into sites where people troll and you just slag off and doesn't work. The idea here would be to build an expert community at the back of this to actually vet the suggestions and work with them and I guess I'd also like to get the public bureaucracies involved in something like this. But uh, that's an example. Uh, I will, uh, well this is just an example, uh, I, I, I put this to you as an example uh, of a problem. eTasker is a, an app that somebody is developing in Australia it's designed as a marketplace for skills, so the idea, it's really the person who designed it was thinking about large consulting companies and people put in their skills and what their timetable looks like and it creates a more liquid flow of skill and skill matching inside a large organisation. He took this to a government organisation in Australia and they said, this is exactly what we need, we can't possibly buy it because we can't specify it in a tender because it doesn't exist yet. Uh, not a very sensible, uh, an, another barrier to a sensible public-private partnership in building the value that we need. But let me try and suggest to you a few somewhat more ambitious public-private partnerships and I will then conclude with my killer example for which I've already told you I have certain expectations of you. Um, so this is uh, Urbain Le Verrier and what, what he did was he told people from observations uh, of one planet, uh, Uranus, that there must be another planet and said roughly where it was. And I want to suggest to you, that's kind of where I've been for a couple of years. I, I've thought this is a big story. Where's my killer example? So I'll get to my killer example, but I'll show you a few other examples. Uh, uh, one is, this is a, this is a free... Uh, uh, medical practice uh, kit and it, make, it monetizes the asset, it monetizes customers by uh, their, their, their typically medical, you know, doctors and so on. Whenever they send an SMS that costs the money and whenever they file with a health insurer that costs the money but the service itself is free and if you were a fitness trainer you could use it for nothing or, you know, it, it doesn't have to be uh, medical. Uh, Australia is trying to computerise its doctors and so it wants doctors to sign up but not necessarily to this one but it wants doctors to get, uh, to get uh, uh, into, you know, get it, to, to um, ensure that their, their practices have appropriate IT but there's a problem because the doctors don't know which package to get and the government is too scared to say, pick this package. Now, what would happen if the government needed to use a package was that the government would design a process which was publicly defensible to instruct it on what package to buy. 
why don't we do this with new technologies? Why don't we try to create an environment in which, uh, which is the sort of environment that eBay has created within eBay, where people are actually steered to the best options via reputational mechanisms? Government's terrified of doing this, but of course it can set up a, me it, and it was, it's rightly terrified of it if the, the relevant uh, cabinet minister says, well, I'm a mate of this business and it's a great business and I recommend it to people. That's not the basis on which you would do it. You would go through some publicly defensible process. Uh, I think there's a big story to be told slowly disappearing uh, because the private sector is imperfectly stepping into the breach, uh, which is to integrate uh, pub private entrepreneurship with the state apparatus more coercive state apparatus and most particularly the demonstration of ID, validation of ID. Uh, now states have these mechanisms and they should have opened them up so that people can opt into them, There's nothing compulsory about it, so that people can opt into them on the internet. As it is, things like Facebook, uh, both Facebook and Google, well, Facebook, Google, Twitter are all moving into this domain, but obviously much less successfully because they don't have the capacity to vouch safe identity to the extent that governments do. Uh, I use rate my professors, my professor because there's a professor in this town who's pretty good, who seems to get consistently low ratings. Now some people have corrected me and said that's because his lectures aren't very good, but other people don't think that's true. Some of you probably have been to them. Uh, but uh, one of the reasons he doesn't get very good ratings is because lots anyone can go on there and say what a terrible man he is and how he's un-American and all that kind of stuff. That's Paul Krugman in case you can't read, uh, can't read it from the slides. Um, so the idea then is to knit together the public and the private sector using opt-in to combine private endeavour and entrepreneurialism with a, a critical service that governments by default already find themselves providing. Uh, and here is another example. This is an Australian company called Culture Amp and it provides a product called Murma. What does Murma do? Murma is a employee survey mechanism uh, for um, an employee survey mechanism whereby a business can inform itself what its employees think about, you know, how engaged they are, how well they think career structures are in the, and, and how family friendly the workplace is and so on. You're familiar with the idea. My idea here is to say, now this company is selling, it's, it's sold successfully to Adobe and to, an, but, but mainly to smaller businesses, Adobe, Box and one or two other businesses in Silicon Valley. So my idea is for a minister for small business somewhere uh, to say, to, to go to Culture Amp. Uh, in fact, you would do this through a more open process than this, but for the purposes of explanation, go to Culture Amp and say, I would like to pay you, how much money do I have to pay you so that every business with fewer than 200 employees in Massachusetts can use this for free? That's easy to do. It's extremely cheap because it wouldn't be a lot of money. Uh, and then you, uh, so, so you're already getting a benefit that you wouldn't have got otherwise. Uh, because you've the the cost to this is this is non rival a non rival risk good and you're getting much more use of it and then you get another big benefit which is you get a data set which is consistent amongst all these businesses that are using this and so you can go and look for patterns and say what are the secrets of companies that have got highly engaged employees you know maybe they're more in this suburb than in that suburb maybe you can then track that to some training course that exists here rather than there could be hugely valuable i envisage this as a a publicly available data set subject to certain privacy regulations it's not a government owned i'm not suggesting the government's going to play the key role in in doing more than curating the data set and uh, places like Harvard University would then go digging around and finding all sorts of interesting things. Uh, Sense T is another Australian project which I've been involved with, which I think is really exciting. It simply, it does a very simple thing. It takes our agricultural sen uh, sensors, currently just around Tasmania, and goes on the proposition that if winemakers need sensors, 
and lamb farmers need sensors and salmon farmers need sensors of certain kinds, then if we build them all into the same platform, it's likely that we're going to build a much more powerful uh, capability, a, a platform on which apps will then be able to be built for all sorts of other things. So we're trying to, uh, that's the sort of thing that's hard to make happen privately with a small amount of government money, it could be hugely beneficial. We've already lowered the cost of oyster farming by 10 or 20 percent uh, because we can narrow down the, the days during which it is unsafe to harvest for reasons of excess water flow and, and all kinds of stuff like that. My killer example. So I'm sitting in a Health 2.0 conference in San Francisco and there is Anne Wojcicki from 23andMe and as she describes her business which is that for, and many of you will know this and some of you will be customers, for $99 they send you a kit uh, and you spit into the kit and they then uh, do a partial analysis of your genome. Now, some of you will already also know that the FDA has got the yips with this, and I'm happy to talk about that in questions, but I'm sort of abstracting from that. If it isn't 99, uh, if it isn't 23andMe, that's fine. It can be some other service provider. Uh, but you clearly want proper integrity to this process, uh, and uh, I'd be more likely to have sort of instinctively support uh, 23andMe against the FDA, but the FDA does seem to have bent over backwards to try and get 23andMe to kind of come on board, and 23andMe pro proceeded to ignore them for six months, which is a bit of a pity. Uh, so these guys get, uh, so, so, so you can see the power of this. Uh, it's, it's currently got 300,000 customers, so it's got 300,000 partial genomes. It inveigles the customer to fill out an elaborate questionnaire to complete as much as they can provide of their, of their phenotype, the, the characteristics, the, 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 the characteristics of their bodies and lives that have been, ex from their genes that have been expressed. That is, so phenotype is a fancy word for do you have backaches, do you how many, how many colds do you get every year? Uh, how, how susceptible might you be, not that you could answer this in a questionnaire, to breast cancer and so on. Uh, you can see that this is a pretty useful, there are some pretty useful possibilities lurking around here. Uh, so um, it apparently, according to Anne Wojcicki, it uh, costs about $400,000 to do a proper genetic association to tie up a genetic association with a particular phenotype. That is so to say this gene, this gene is associated with, with breast cancer more than your average gene. These guys manage to replicate 180 such associations in a few months. Uh, basically just get all their data and look for the associations in their phenotype data. Uh, because also the other things people answer in this data, uh, the, the other things people answer in this questionnaire is, you know, what did your mother die of, what did your father die of, you're getting a lot of information about what's being expressed from this, from this gene pool. Um, the UK wants to, it, it has just spent a lot of money, I think it's getting 10,000 complete genomes, not the partial genome sequencing that 23andMe provides. So. Um, Here's my idea. 300,000 patients is pathetic. Okay, this is an incredible thing. The more we get on the database, the more powerful it is for us all. We are, what we've got is one of these public-private ecologies. And it's crazy, in my opinion, at least in Australia, where we have a national health insurer, a government-owned national health insurer, as I virtually well, many other countries have, uh, and the United States is kind of nibbling its way to that destination. Um, uh, so with a national health insurer, the national health insurer has an interest in our, this health system has an interest in lowering health costs. Now I can't believe that the Australian health system, which pays for any important health care needs that I have, 
uh, and a large share of the other healthcare needs, I can't imagine that it isn't worth $99 capital value to that system to know a, something about my genome, with privacy protected, of course. I get screened, I got a, I got a parcel in the post uh, for uh, prostate, uh, no, it wasn't prostate cancer, uh, bowel cancer. Uh, a do-it-yourself do it kit, it's not much fun to go through the steps, uh, a do-it-yourself kit from the government or from the government health, uh, health insurer and you would be able to target that and breast ca cancer screening and prostate cancer screening more accurately with this kind of data. Mo the moment you got the genome you could say, right, those people have, should be doing this every six months, these people should be doing it every ten years. Uh, that's just the beginning of the sort of value that this has, the sort of public value that this has. But the, but the public sector have all sorts of other advantages. So uh, the public sector has, or the, the health system, if you like, has all sorts of networks. It can use nudges. When you go to the doctor, you can have a form, say, we'll pay the $99 because by now it's sort of $50 given economies of scale and the fact that you don't have to market and so on. We'll pay, it's completely free. If you don't want to do it, that's fine. Sign here and uh, in two weeks' time you'll get an email and you'll have your own page on 23andMe or a similar provider. Uh, uh, for not, that, that cost, uh, the, the, the often the, the non-obstruction is important when we think of the FDA and, and 23andMe, although I'm not uh, taking sides on that particular one at the moment. And financially internalizing the cost, the $99 or the $50 or whatever the total cost turns out to be can easily be covered by the social insurer because it generates that much value to the social insurer and then there are all sorts of additional benefits because you then have a much more powerful database on which you can go searching for these relationships. Doesn't have to be Australia. Uh, so this is the, the landscape that I've been talking about uh, and each of these PPPs, each of these public-private partnerships, uh, uh, I guess I should justify this word impresario. The reason I call this government as impresario is that it's not government as coercer, it's not government as funder, which are the two big, or, or regulator. It's the government as, as a, an organisation that makes things happen out of, the out of resources that lie dormant in the environment. That's the idea that I'm suggesting and also the idea of the of the, um, the multiplicity of possibilities, the, the many different uh, routines that can be used to make these two sectors, these two aspects of our being uh, integrate better together. And each public-private partnership generates services as a public and or private goods. It generates data as a public good and it will, it will, it, it has old-fashioned industry development uh, uh, appeal. These are some of the routines that I've referred to, and I won't spend any time on that, any more time on that, except to perhaps, perhaps during questions I can come back to that slide if you want to ask more questions. There are some examples I haven't even talked about there, uh, but uh, that's government as impresario. And then finally, I want to talk about the art of the, the public-private partnership. Um, because it's very easy, there was a book many of you may remember called Reinventing Government, was that what it was called? Uh, it was about, it's about 20 years old now. It was awful. Uh, it was full of great examples and then the author said, why can't governments be like the private sector? Well, they're not the private sector, they're better than the private sector in some ways and they're worse than the private sector in other ways and anyway, a lot of this literature has the, a huge bias, which is survivor bias, which is you pick the best examples and the examples that have survived, and you say, well, why can't this necessarily monolithic government, this, there is just one of them, why can't it be like the very best company in this private industry? Well, it's not very likely that it will be that. So it seems to me that the task is, is a deeper one than that. The task is... To, to solve the problems that modern liberal democratic government have, has had to solve for 200 years. 
which is to build institutions which create public goods in ways that um, dovetail properly, not just technically, not just economically, but politically with private goods. That's been the great achievement of modern liberal democratic government. And so here, the task is not to say, gee, why doesn't the government build more platforms like the private sector does, although sometimes that will be a useful thing to do, but to come up with the appropriate terms of engagement between the two sectors that play to their strengths, not their weaknesses. Both Britain and um, Australia have just been through two decades of these things called public-private partnerships which were used to fund government, what were essentially government assets, and they were as a result much more expensive because it cost the private sector more money to borrow, it cost, it's much higher, bearing a much higher rate of interest, a much higher capital cost than governments. So we managed to invent this whole new, we had public-private partnerships before, we, the way we delineated the public and the private was that the public sector say, said where a road went and then got it, got, went, and got, went and funded the project and got private contractors in to build the road, that's perfect. That works well, that plays to the strengths of the two sectors. We messed that up and called it public-private partnerships and got the private sector to fund the roads and they were supposed to take the risk and they don't really take the risk properly and they're also because the public can't do without their road if it goes wrong and the cost of the capital is much, they did, they did this stuff in Greece. Uh, to push debt off government books. That's roughly what it was all about. It was a dodgy system. So that's the, the sort of um, the, the, the provenance of the expression public-private partnership and yet it is so full of potential, I think. It needs to play to each, other's, each sector's strengths. It, that includes cultural economic norms and imperatives. Uh, and you can see that when governments do things successfully they can answer questions like, have you, is there unfa undue favouritism here? Is there due process? The kinds of things that are small beer in the private sector because the private sector is competitive. And this has to be done within the hard-won traditions of modern liberal democratic government. Uh, so uh, my final kind of wish um, is that our thinking about, in thinking about data PPPs, thinking about data public-private partnerships, uh, some of the ways we can do things, as for instance with that website Murmur, um, that's a very clean thing for a government to do. That argument that some privately provided services has much lower marginal costs than fixed costs is a very old argument in economics and was very big in the 1920s and 1930s, leading a lot of economists to argue that the state should subsidise private railroad, railroads, subsidise their fixed costs to allow passengers and freight to travel at marginal cost, which economist models tells them is the right price, the most efficient price. The problem is it's extremely difficult to build a political and technical system that will deliver that. That isn't the case with a website where you just say, we'll pay you money and all the people in, in, with this postcode get it for free, is that okay with you? So, so new things become possible, new ways of interpreting old ideas become possible and by doing that we might even find that these ideas that, have, that, that I'm trying to develop in data uh, about the, the integration of public and private sectors, the interface between them could then come back to uh, the interface between the public and private sector, between government and other collective institutions and private endeavour in all sorts of other areas. Thank you. So happy to Answer any questions. Uh, Amar was going to say that you were free to interrupt at any stage, and I forgot to tell you that, but you were. <laughs> yep. Um, so, when the government does a private public partnership with one of these organizations, how do they go about picking the right one and not being sort of the kingmaker in there? Sort of like, Tender. why should they pick 23 and me instead of some they one shouldn't. of the competitors? Yeah, they shouldn't. So, they do, typically, I mean, the, if 
th there is a bit of a dilemma if, if, the, if a particular company has been particularly innovative. But typically, the, 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 the safe answer is you get the idea, then you go tender it. And the advantage that 23andMe will have from being more innovative is that it's in a better position to respond to the tender. But you absolutely have to go through a process which is publicly defensible. No question about it. Yeah. Are you familiar with the uh, European public-private partnerships, such as the Not future internet? <laughs> Sorry? Such as the future internet, which was an idea to make a large public cloud. Uh, not particularly. I'm, I'm a little bit, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm sort of come to big European public projects with some uh, skepticism, uh, but you know it's clearly the right line of inquiry. I think. I'm on the review board. Yeah. Quite a few of these things, and our largest problem with the public-private partnerships that we tried to fund uh, was that generally it was the tender. The tender would almost always be captured by organizations who were viewed by the governments as conservative and also with very good professional grant writers. Yeah. Um, so for example, a lot of almost all of the future internet funding went to the large telcos, Telecom Italia. And you know, I told the commission, you know, you basically A, they never built anything that worked. <laughs> and yeah. it was basically a huge waste of public money. You could yeah. have taken the money, put it in a bucket, and lit it on fire. Yeah. That's about as much as <laughs> that's about as much of an effect the future internet project had, despite the fact that actually a public cloud probably would be a great idea. So I agree with everything theoretically, what you said, but I think the devil really is in the details yep. of the tender. And also how do you, so almost every successful Web 2.0 platform um, has not been built with public money. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, I don't know of any single one that has. Yep. So my question is how can you make, I mean, I'm actually interested in how can you make that happen. I think it, it yep. must be possible, yep. but somehow when Europe tried to play this game, yeah, yeah, yeah. they Absolutely. wasted about a billion, billions of up. euros, really. You would billions. expect them to screw it up because you've got a big government, a big, which I'm not too down on government. The thing is, remember that list of uh, platforms I put up, Google, Twitter, and so on. Um, when I, uh, in 2009, I used to talk about those things and I said, these are technically public goods, not one of them was built by a government. Well, the other thing I noticed a couple of months later was not one of them was built by an existing organisation of any size whatsoever. So this was at a time, you know, the late 90s, early 2000s, when Microsoft had 20, 30 billion dollars in the bank looking for the next big thing, couldn't even find these things. So. I agree. I mean, I, that's why I was talking about my skepticism. I'm not actually talking about publicly funded platforms necessarily. The example I've given is a genuine public-private partnership with something like 23andMe or some other private, uh, some other private organization. Um, I agree with you that the devil's in the detail, and I played it safe when I answered that first question by saying, uh, have a tender. And I think once you do that, you are you do become aware of some of the problems of tenders. Uh, another thing you can do is have prizes. Uh, there are plenty of problems with prizes. Uh, another thing you can do is when when you were talking about all that money and setting a light to it, I thought you were going to say we'll have all that money and we'll kind of give it away to good bets in the private market. There are lots of that. There is a wide repertoire that you can dip into, and I'm not suggesting that it's going to necessarily bring home the bacon, but it. But I agree with you that just the old organizations doing this according to the old ways is likely to be a waste of time. All of the Web 2.0 platforms were built on open standards. On developed, open standards, Developed yeah. by, uh, you know, consensus-driven communities developing public goods. Yeah. And these bodies are not clearly things that would work for public-private partnerships in the way that, let's say, Google or Facebook are not companies. Blah, blah, blah. But th these bodies are also traditionally underfunded. Uh, so traditionally? Underfunded. Uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. W3C is operating budgets 10 But million. I think what, you're, you, what you might be doing, it would be an easy thing to do, would be to imagine that I'm suggesting that we build well, rec easily recognizable platforms. You know, here's the public-private pl partnership. Sense T is an example of that from from my presentation. A platform. I guess what I'm thinking about is I, I certainly think about these things in the way that I think you do, which is that it's the underfunded and the people who need to make use of 
uh, other open source stuff that's around and do lots of sharing. That's the way it's like, that's the way success is likely to come. So the public-private partnership needs to be to try and ginger up and resource that process, not to be high we're from the government, this is what we're building. Uh, so you can imagine the example of 23andMe, you can imagine a government doing something fairly simple, which is to, which is again like Mer the example I had with Murma, which is to say, uh, to announce that it has an interest in this project, it has an interest in there being more, if it's an Australian, if it's Australia's Medicare, that it has an interest in a larger database than the 10,000 Australian customers of 23andMe, and it will uh, be, you know, will look at funding. It, it will, it will start to talk about what it can do to help this asset build and to be useful to the system. So that's not a perfect answer, but it's it's in the same spirit as the question in the sense that I think we sort of have to work at this and not allow the logic of large organisations to take over because they'll screw it up. We know that. What about it? Well, I mean, it's sort of a public-private partnership. The government takes while there is. Yeah, well, this is, but that's a sort of... Very different model than European it's a, Well, if I understand you correctly, it's a traditional... Uh, you can imagine that sort of thing being written about in the 30s, you know, like the idea that business and business assets are simply things that you build. You fund and you build and there's the asset and you have engineers building it. And we kind of know that that isn't very good anymore. Um, so I am speaking in a way that is, um, that comes from that place, uh, but it does, but that, that robs me of the opportunities to just, the opportunity to just say, uh, you've got problem, uh, T1, here's the module T1, that's the solution, go away and don't bother me anymore. Yes? I was going to ask about the perspective of government as investor. When yep. you an empresario or a publisher, publishers often make bets on books that yep. they materialize. Yep. Um, having worked in government, I know it's really tough for government to ever like put out money and get yep. it back. I was working yep. on a challenge where we had grants and we also yep. had um, yeah. loan money, but yes. getting the loan money out was almost impossible, even though That's companies right. wanted it. So yeah. I'm wondering, have you seen organizations that inspire you inside governments that do this kind of thing? Um, uh, yeah, I think the answer is sort of yes, but but um, I'm, I'm not sure that I can give you um, there's one example uh, but, but I'm not sure that I can give you specific examples, but the, the art of this is, t is in the framing of the problem. If you have a government saying, as it did with Solyndra, well, no, I don't know whether you did it with Solyndra, but the politics didn't work at, well, out with Solyndra. But if you have a government saying, we need to invest more in research and development on uh, renewable energy, here is a whole pile of money. We expect 70% of these projects not to work. That's the way this, this that's the way this, 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 the total amount will work, uh, does work. It's there to take risks. So expect some of these things to fail. Uh, politicians then are warned that they don't go and anchor their credibility to the success of this project. It isn't like a bridge. It's an experiment. Uh, so I was, I'm, I'm the chairman of a small organisation in Adelaide in Australia called the Australian Centre for Social Innovation. And we funded 10 uh, projects with grants. And I was there giving a speech next to the Premier. And I said, I hope some of these, these projects fail. And that shocked a few people, and I explained what I meant. And uh, so that's how to present it. Is it totally easy? No, doubly so in this country. Uh, but, you know, we, we, have, we have been able to build sophisticated institutions in government that don't seem to, compl that don't seem to instantly default to vox pop. Um, but that's the task. The task is to build them. And you can't just build them with a hero project because the hero project then is, is, is brought into the logic that you're actually trying to undermine. Um, but it's about building institutions and building public institutional capacity. And I think that can be done. Yeah. Are there limitations to the sector uh, in which this can work? So you give uh, some examples of healthcare. Um, some examples of, of uh, 
of sort of crowdsourcing, crowdsourcing opinions and around policy. But are there limitations uh, to um, what areas the yeah. government should outsource? Um, to what areas the government should rely on a kind of neoliberal solution to um, to public problems? Or I guess the, the more direct question is, are there areas in which the public should be protected as a thing mm. um, and not be extended out into the partnership? Well, I guess the answer sort of is yes, but it's, uh, you know, that joke where the, where the, the punchline is it's turtles all the way down. Um, that, 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 that who's guarding, I mean, the NSA is a public organisation to protect the public. Do you feel protected? Um, so, so all of these all of these forms are subject to uh, human imperfection. Uh, but, but uh, you know, I don't believe in mercenaries, for instance. I think uh, I, I'm not very keen on public on um, privately funded prisons. But usually. Um, Usually when you look at that, you're often missing what matters more, which is how you set up the, the environment in which they work, because you actually want prisons to try and minimise recidivism. You want to get them trying to do that. And it isn't actually uh, terribly beneficial to have a big ideological argument about it. But uh, yes, uh, you name some things that you think should be done by government. I can't see private courts, for instance, being very helpful. Um, so yes, there are core government things, no question about it. There are They're kind of yeah. are yeah. shadow of that. That's right. They're and civil. They, and it is valuable to think of the private analogue often simply to double back on asking, well, what do we actually want out of the, uh, the government institution? We don't particularly want it to be a government institution. We want it to be true to a certain spirit. Um, so there's always value in that. Um, and there's a value in sort of trying to think through this thing without saying, oh, and, and we're just in this conversation, we're sort of getting a bit sidetracked. In, I mean, I've presented some ideas that are in an area that are very, where those ideas I think are very propitious. Are they as propitious for building roads? Well, I don't think they are. Um, but, but I'm still wanting to make sure that the ideas go backwards and forwards. Yes. Okay. Right. In many of the cases you described, the government would end up choosing among, as you said, with a tender among various alternatives, and also the areas you described are full of innovation yeah. and are still emerging. For example, yeah. with a lighthouse, it's pretty clear, you know, yeah. that's what that's you right. want. You, you can put the new technology up in the up yeah, in the and then the, that area. technology is Correct. is fairly well. That's right. Settled. So you don't want to freeze innovation. Yeah, but. From what I understood, you're saying that it's useful for the government to choose one, for example, um, um, set of software for collecting these uh, employee ratings, because then you have um, comparable data sets. Is that right? Not At least entirely that was one right, of, but I mean, you're on to a very important question. Well, that was one of the reasons. But then what I'm trying to figure out is how you balance the two. Yeah, so, for example, 23andMe, there was a big story in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago about somebody who spat into three different boxes That's from right, three different companies that, and completely separate results. Yeah. So it seems as if that technology still has some evolving to do until it sure. gets to the lighthouse stage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you balance those two? Yeah. Um, the way you, I think what you're looking for, and this is why it's so much better in something like data than in freeways, um, is that there are all sorts of ways in which you can build the essentially the portabilities that you need into the new system. So you say to 23andMe, if they win the tender, your, all your standards have to be open. If you don't win the tender that we run in five years' time, all of your, everything you've done is portable, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. So there are a lot of opportunities to address that problem. It, like everything else, it won't fully address it, in which case you have a dilemma and you have to make, you have to balance that. In the question of MoMA, the employee survey, there will just the literal questions that are asked become an important because another company might say our technology is better because the questions uh, are more predictive of the things that we want to predict. But, the, but what you can do with MoMA is say, well, you've now lost the tender, we get all the data, uh, and so it's reasonably, that, that issue I think is reasonably well dealt with. 
and the other thing is that the government doesn't always have to choose anything because you've got an opt-in operating a lot of the time. Uh, and in the example that I gave you of that website health kit, all the government was doing was running a process whereby a doctor looking at the market could say, as they say in eBay, this one looks more, re or TripAdvisor, uh, to take an example that's close to my heart right now as a traveler, uh, can get information about what other people's experience is. And we have a protocol in government to say, oh, well, to do anything like that would be to pick winners and, and would be, uh, is not to be encouraged. Well, my argument is it is to be encouraged. What has to be addressed is the probity issues. And then you can have the best of both worlds. I'm happy to stick around for anyone who wants to. Folks, I know. But please join me in thanking him. Thank you.